Good morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalu and Dr. Orsoro, um, and to the Bloodless Medicine and Surgical Society for inviting me to speak this morning. It's super early here in Washington, D.C., but I'm so honored to be speaking. So I am at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, and I'll be discussing our experience with bloodless medicine and surgery. So we will talk about some things that we do here that are a little unique, specifically hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So we're gonna talk about the mechanisms of oxygen delivery and extraction. In the human body, we'll talk about what hyperbaric oxygen therapy is and how it can be used in bloodless medicine patients. Um, we'll talk about something that we're working on here that um, is an up and coming project about how hyperbarics can affect erythropoiesis. And then finally, we will review our approach here at MedStar Georgetown to the treatment of the bloodless medicine patient. So we're going to do a quick review of oxygen delivery. So you guys are all aware of this, but hemoglobin is the major carrier of oxygen in the human body. And the oxygen content that's delivered by hemoglobin to the body depends on two things. It depends on the arterial oxygen content as well as the cardiac index. The arterial oxygen content is really just the amount of oxygen in the blood and the cardiac index is the amount of blood that's pumped by the heart in one second. And this is the equation that shows the relationship between the two. So really, if you want to increase your oxygen delivery in your body, you need to either modify your arterial oxygen content or your cardiac index. So the oxygen that the blood or the hemoglobin delivers to tissues is then extracted and used by the human body. And on average, the human body extracts about five to six volume percent of oxygen from the blood. So that sounds like a very random number, but just remember it for right now, five to six percent, because we will go back to that. Normally, when oxygen supply equals oxygen extraction, we don't have oxygen debt, everyone's happy, our bodies work well, and everything is fine. However, in patients who are severely anemic, the oxygen supply might not be sufficient to compensate for the oxygen extraction of the body. So when this happens, when hemoglobin concentrations drop below six grams per deciliter, the oxygen delivery and extraction become unequal. We see, and we've all seen this in humans, that humans become a little more confused and altered. They have impairments in reaction time and as well as memory. And then when hemoglobin goes below four, tissue oxygenation is significantly impaired. And we see patients that are really confused, very, very altered. So in the severely anemic population, we can modify our arterial oxygen delivery either by improving cardiac index, which is sort of hard to do, or by changing the arterial oxygen content. And so the latter is what we're going to focus on now. So the arterial oxygen content, again, is just the amount of oxygen in the arterial blood, and it's really mostly dependent on hemoglobin. If you think back to early medical school days, we all learned that each hemoglobin molecule can carry a very fixed amount, about 1.3 cc's um, of oxygen per gram of hemoglobin. And then there's this really, really small amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the plasma that we normally just forget about because it's completely insignificant in most cases. This is the arterial oxygen content equation, and this is the equation that shows the relationship between the plasma dissolved oxygen, this number over here on the right that's very, very small, as well as the hemoglobin brown bound fraction. Again, you'll see that the, the plasma dissolved oxygen is normally a really small number. It's multiplied in this equation by 0 0.003. So again, generally at you know normal um, normal human physiology, normal treatment, no, normal pressures. This is a very, very small number. And we really just, you know, use hemoglobin. And so again, this is the basis for giving blood transfusion is that we can increase the hemoglobin in the body to increase the oxygen delivery to the tissues. So again, in normal individuals, the oxygen bound to hemoglobin is really all that we care about. We just ignore this second number over here that I have in red. Again, it's multiplied by a uh, fraction of 0 0.003. So it's pretty insignificant. But what if you don't have any hemoglobin or what if you can't receive hemoglobin? So when a person's hemoglobin is depleted, then the oxygen that's dissolved in the plasma can act as the main unit of blood oxygen content. And so in that case, we can pretty much ignore this hemoglobin fraction and really just focus on the plasma dissolved oxygen. 
So this is where hyperbaric oxygen therapy comes in. So with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, we can greatly enhance the plasma dissolved oxygen. And this is because of Henry's law. So now we're going back to high school physics. And remember the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT and all of its little surrounding gas laws. Henry's law is one of those. So Henry's law states that as the pressure increases, the amount of gas dissolved in a solution is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas in the solution. So really all this says is that when the partial pressure of a gas increases, more gas dissolves in solution. It's pretty simple. Here's a little pictorial of it. And if any of you are scuba divers, you will know that Henry's law is the reason that scuba divers get decompression sickness. So decompression sickness is caused by air or nitrogen bubbles. Air is mostly nitrogen. When scuba divers dive under pressure underwater, they uh, dissolve nitrogen in their tissues and they have to make a decompression stop when they come up to the surface to sort of off gas that nitrogen. If that off gassing does not happen at the appropriate rate, then decompression sickness results. So, he, so Henry's law is responsible for decompression sickness, which is bad, but it's also responsible for increased plasma oxygenation under hyperbaric conditions, which is good. So I think a lot of people have a basic understanding of hyperbarics. I'm gonna go into a little review of it for you guys. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is defined as a treatment in which patients breathe 100% oxygen while the treatment vessel or the hyperbaric chamber is pressurized to greater than sea level. So this is something that's actually really common in hospitals in the US and as well as Europe. So in the US alone, there's uh, hyperbaric facilities in around 1300 medical facilities nationwide. So even though you might not be aware of hyperbaric oxygen therapy at your hospital, it's probably there. It may not be used a lot for anemic patients because people might not know about that, uh, that use of it, but it's probably located in an outpatient wound center somewhere used for diabetic foot wounds and other conditions. It's very different than scuba diving. We're giving you 100% oxygen, not air. So hyperbaric patients will never get decompression sickness. And actually, hyperbarics is actually a treatment for decompression sickness. There's different types of hyperbaric chambers. If you do a Google search, this is what you'll see. So this is a example of a single person or a monoplace hyperbaric chamber. This is a multi-place or um, a multi-person hyperbaric chamber. These chambers can carry, contain up to like, you know, 20 patients. The patients enter through this door over here. Um, this is something that gets a lot of attention in the press and a lot of professional athletes have this. I actually just read a story the other day about the, um, one of the football players, Russell Wilson in the U S he says that he has two hyperbaric chambers to help him recover after his games. The hyperbaric chambers used by professional athletes are normally something like this. This is a soft sided chamber. These unfortunately do not really achieve hyperbaric pressures. They're actually not hyperbaric oxygen chambers, and they are only approved by the US Food and Drug Administration for treatment of altitude sickness. These really do not attain the hyperbaric pressurization at all. So this would not be considered hyperbarics, despite what you'll see in the news media. This is a topical oxygen device. This again is not hyperbarics because the patient is not breathing in the oxygen in this topical device. Um, the oxygen concentrations that we can achieve in the human body and the plasma are really a function of the systemic inhalation of oxygen, which allows the plasma dissolved oxygen to greatly increase. Putting topical oxygen on a foot or something like that, for example, does not do the same effect. This is an example again of a multi-person hyperbaric chamber. We call it a multi-place chamber. This particular chamber is at University of Maryland in Baltimore. It can hold, I think, about 25 to 30 people. Um, these are pretty fancy. You can do critical care in them. This is my old uh, multi-place chamber in Hartford, Connecticut. And the patients can walk in, they can slide in, they can go in a wheelchair, and they just sit here and wear these clear plastic, clear, yeah, plastic hoods over their heads. And that's how they breathe the oxygen. You can see that we have a little TV screen in there for the patients um, to watch a movie. This back here is a transfer lock. So you, um, if you've ever, you know, if you've, you've probably never tried this, but if you ever tried to open the door of a hyperbaric chamber, once it's pressurized, you can't do it. So if you need to have a person enter a hyperbaric chamber while it's under pressure for any reason, you actually have a little transfer lock down here. It's a small little chamber where a physician or nurse can pressurize down um, to the treatment depth. When the pressure is equal, that door just opens up and you can just walk right in.
So these chambers are actually not very common in the United States. They're very expensive to put in and to maintain. So most of the chambers, at least in the United States, are what we call monoplace chambers. And monoplace chambers hold a single person. They look like this. They're made of acrylic and steel. The acrylic is the clear portion that you see where the patient can you know, maintain eye contact with the, the technician outside the chamber, actually speak back and forth um, if needed. These chambers do come in different sizes. Um, the one that you see in the picture on the left looks like it's a pretty good size. Patients can you know, frequently sit up and move around. The older chambers are the smaller ones that you see on the right side here where the patient has to lay flat. But in general, it's a, it's, you know, it's a pretty good size treatment chamber. Patients are able to sit up, move around. Um, they're not confined. It's not like an MRI. So even patients who are claustrophobic do really well in hyperbaric chambers of any size for the most part. So our professional society in the U.S. is called the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medicine Society, or UHMS. This is the current UHMS list of approved indications or diagnoses for hyperbaric medicine in the U.S. And you'll see that we have things like carbon monoxide poisoning, decompression sickness, um, acute burns, compromised grafts and flaps. And then, wow, look at number seven on the list, severe anemia. So severe anemia is a recognized indication in the U.S. for administration of hyperbaric medicine. And a lot of physicians and other healthcare professionals are just not aware of this. It blows my mind. So how does it work again? All right, remember that we talked about the oxygen extraction is about five, five to six uh, volume percent. Um, in the human body. So if you are breathing room air right now, so right now we are all breathing room air. I don't see anybody who has an oxygen mask on. Um, just assume that we are all at sea level pressure. Um, if we checked a blood gas on any of us right now, an ABG, our, our PaO2 or our partial pressure of oxygen in the blood would be approximately 100 millimeters of mercury. Under hyperbaric conditions, you can see all the way down. If you pressurize somebody to the equivalent of 66 feet underwater or three absolute atmospheres, you can get a PaO2 of over 2000. So you can increase your PaO2 by more than 20. This is your plasma dissolved oxygen. And if you put that back into the arterial oxygen content equation and multiply it by 0.003, you get six. So that's wonderful. So under hyperbaric conditions, you can actually optimize your plasma oxygenation to the point where your oxygen supply will equal your oxygen extraction. <clears throat> so this is how we use it. So this has been studied for many years. And the first report of the use of hyperbarics for anemia was actually an animal study that came out in the 1950s. And this was a study from a uh, done by a Dutch surgeon, cardiovascular surgeon, and he took piglets and he bled them out and intubated them. And then he infused them with this continuous plasma like solution. He um, measured their hemoglobin levels. They were like 0.4 to 0.6, so completely incompatible with life. And then he pressurized the animals in a hyperbaric chamber to three atmospheres for 45 minutes. So after that 45 minute period, even though those animals had hemoglobins of 0.4 to 0.6, completely incompatible with life, they survived. And he transfused them after the, after the procedure back to their preoperative hemoglobin. And they were very, very happy and they all did fine. So this was the first report of hyperbarics being used to increase plasma oxygenation and maintain life. And it's been used a lot since then. So we now know that hyperbaric oxygen therapy can provide enough oxygen dissolved in the plasma to maintain the basic metabolic functions of the brain and the heart and the other organs in our body that are high oxygen extractors. So because of this, we really should consider the use of hyperbarics for symptomatic and acutely anemic patients who can't receive transfusion. There's a couple caveats. You need to treat these patients as deep as you can. So usually hyperbaric facilities have specific treatment protocols. Um, I know at my hospital, we have two different treatment depths. We put our anemic patients at the deeper depth because remember, the, deep, the deeper that you go, the more oxygen dissolves in your plasma. Um, it's transient, so we frequently will treat these patients multiple times a day if they are very symptomatic. And... Um, we, this is what we do. And so there's only a small amount of literature about this. It's interesting. I'm actually trying to publish a case of this right now. And the journals keep saying, well, this is not unique. Well, you know what? It's actually quite unique because there's very few cases 
case reports and case series published on this actual topic. There's no standard treatment protocol. We tailored the hyperbaric treatment duration um, based on the clinical condition of the patient. And we will generally stop treatments either when the patient's anemia improves or resolves, or if the patient has normalization of their vital signs, um, resolution of EKG changes, and improvement in their mental status. And of course, hyperbarics is for the most part an adjunct of therapy. So we use it in conjunction with our other bloodless medicine techniques, which at our hospital include things like reduction of unnecessary blood draws, use of pediatric tubes, recombinant human erythropoietin if indicated, as well as intravenous iron. But overall, acute blood loss is still an under-recognized and underutilized indication for hyperbarics. In the US though, most insurance carriers consider it to be medically necessary for patients who can't undergo transfusion. But unfortunately, a lot of clinicians and physicians are still unfamiliar with this treatment. So this is what we do at Georgetown. We utilize, we've been utilizing hyperbarics for several years now. I'm gonna show you one of the first cases that we ever implemented hyperbarics on. Um, this was a 43 year old female. She was a Jehovah's Witness and she walked into the ER one day and with abdominal pain. And so she was diagnosed with this hepatic mass. And so she came into the hospital in I think around February 10th for an elective CT guided liver biopsy. So she had the procedure, but immediately afterwards, she became hypotensive with a blood pressure in the 50s and complained of right upper quadrant pain. Turns out that she had a right hepatic artery um, tear that occurred during the procedure. And so she was taken in immediately to interventional radiology straight from the PACU and she underwent right hepatic artery embolization. And post-procedure, her hemoglobin was 5.6 and her baseline hemoglobin was 10. So <clears throat> she lost a significant amount of her blood volume during this bleed. So she was admitted, she was in the ICU. She got daily IV iron. It's actually a typo. And she got sodium ferric gluconate as well as recombinant human erythropoietin. Her hemoglobin kept dropping. So um, on post-procedure day four, we finally got involved from the hyperbaric side when her hemoglobin was 4.6. We started her hyperbaric treatments. I believe that would, that would have been a Friday. We started her treatments the following Monday. Um, she got five treatments. What we noticed that was really interesting was that within four to five days of starting hyperbarics, her automated reticulocyte count doubled, it shot up through the roof. And by the time that she was discharged on post-procedure day 14, her hemoglobin was 6.3. So still not perfect, but a lot better than 4.6. So we brought her back after discharge for additional treatments. She came in for weekly IV iron. She also got continuous erythropoietin and we continued hyperbarics on her her hemoglobin concentration kept on going up. So the procedure was on February 10th. On February 24th, her hemoglobin was 6.3. This is when she was discharged from the hospital. And by uh, a month later on March 22nd, it was up to 13. So her hemoglobin was higher than her baseline pre-procedure hemoglobin. And she was uh, able to undergo a successful trisegmentectomy of, of her liver lesion on um, the following month in April. This, uh, just ignore the bottom graph. This is another patient, but this is just a graph of her absolute retic count. And we can see that once we initiated hyperbaric treatments, it started going way up. So by the time she was discharged, her absolute retic count, or I'm sorry, her automated retic count was 12.9%, which was great. So we knew that she was going to regain her normal blood volume shortly thereafter. So let's talk about why this might happen. Why does hyperbarics seem to have this association with increased reticulocytosis? So um, in terms of erythropoietin, breath hold divers, so divers that you know dive underwater looking for pearls or whatever, they hold their breath during the entire time. So they're not breathing any gases. They have elevated EPO levels. Relative hypoxia occurs while they're diving because again, they're not breathing anything in. And then when they return to the surface, they get a relative hyperoxia because they start to breathe in air again. However, commercial saturation divers have lower EPO levels. So saturation divers are divers that are employed by companies that are putting like telephone cables and stuff in, you know, on the floor of the ocean. Um, it's very expensive and very life-threatening to actually compress and decompress these people to like a thousand feet on a daily basis. You just physically can't do it. So these divers um, basically live in a hyperbaric environment for up to a month at a time while they are working. And they just kind of pop out in a diving bell, go do their job, pop back in the diving bell and, you know, eat their meals and whatever else under pressure under, um, you know, for the 30 days. So these divers actually have lower EPO levels because they are actually hyperoxic while they're doing their job. They're breathing compressed air. So they're breathing increased partial pressures of oxygen. 
And then when they return to the surface, they get hypoxic relatively. So it seems like relative hypoxia is a stimulus for this endogenous EPO production. And this is what's known as the normobaric oxygen paradox. So it makes sense that hyperbarics actually might do something about this. Hyperbaric seems to result in intermittent hyperoxia with relative hypoxia when you come out of the chamber. So does it increase human EPO as well? So this was studied, it's only been looked at in one study thus far. There were 16 healthy adults who breathed 100% oxygen at sea level for two hours. And then a week later, they breathed hyperbaric oxygen for one hyperbaric treatment. And serum EPO levels are measured before as well as after their hyperbaric oxygen treatment. And what was found was that after they breathe just like regular sea level oxygen, their serum EPO levels increased significantly. But after they, they went under, under the hyperbaric treatment, their EPO levels decreased. And this, the EPO concentrations were decreased for at least a day after these people got hyperbarics. So it seems like a single hyperbaric treatment doesn't really work. It actually does really the opposite of what we would think that it would do. It actually decreases um, EPO concentrations. We don't really know why. Um, hyperbarics does lead to several things physiologically, including increased reactive oxygen species, but also results in decreased oxygen free radical scavengers. And so this balance might actually lead to decreased EPO synthesis. But this was a single study. Um, so we don't really know if what the impact of multiple hyperbaric treatments, this was just a result of a single hyperbaric study. And what we're seeing here at Georgetown is that multiple hyperbaric treatments do seem to increase reticulocytosis more than just the effect of giving EPO alone. So again, we don't really know why this happens, but it seems to be significant. And we've noticed it in sustained patients over years here at Georgetown. So because of this, we implement the use of hyperbarics for all severely anemic patients, because we think that this is something that's really increasing their reticulocyte count. It's going to decrease their length of stay and increase their resolution of anemia more rapidly. And so again, we use hyperbarics at Georgetown as an adjunct of treatment along with other standard bloodless medicine techniques. So we treated about 35 plus from my few patients since 2017. We treat patients daily or twice daily, depending on, on their symptoms. Um, and again, we use a treatment depth of 2.4 atmospheres. Our patients are identified initially by Dick Verstrait, who is our bloodless medicine nurse coordinator. And he will recommend additional treatments, including IV iron and recombinant human erythropoietin. We check reticulocyte panels. So we generally will we'll, we'll work with the admitting service to not do daily labs. We try to do labs maybe every other day, maybe three times a week. And we will add on a reticulocyte panel to these patients whenever they get labs. And we'll monitor the patient's retic counts. We treat the patients until their hemoglobin stabilizes or until the patient is hemodynamically stable for discharge. This normally requires about five to 10 treatments. And then we bring the patients back as an outpatient as well. <clears throat> so again, we've treated over 30 patients to date with, <laughs> with hyperbarics. <clears throat> our lowest hemoglobin was 2.1. She survived. Um, our highest hemoglobin was 9.3. And we found that use of serial hyperbaric treatments seems to be associated with a rapid increase in hemoglobin concentration and reticulocytosis, as well as decreased length of stay. I have to say the patients love their hyperbaric treatments. We had a patient come into the hospital um, a couple of years ago. He had, was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, has frequent GI bleeds. We did hyperbarics on him. He did great. We, he came back last week. And when our um, when Dick, our nurse, went down to the ER to see him, the patient said to Dick, I have to get into that hyperbaric chamber again. Um, so the patients really, I think it's also because we, we see them every day. They, they know that this is a particular bloodless medicine treatment. Um, and then we have some special treats for our Jehovah's Witness patients. Hyperbaric patients watch movies while they're in the hyperbaric chamber. And we were lucky enough to acquire some of the Jehovah's Witness movies so that our patients can be much more comfortable in the environment while they're in the hyperbaric chamber. All right, so we've used hyperbarics for perioperative blood loss and GI bleeds, but also for some random diagnoses like autoimmune hemolysis and severe B12 deficiency, mild dysplastic syndrome, and drug-induced bone marrow suppression. Again, the patients are generally very accepting of hyperbarics. The Jehovah's Witness elders and the HLC are also very appreciative of our treatment. Um, the Jehovah's Witness patients overall are pretty healthy, so they have very few contraindications to hyperbarics. There's not that many contraindications out there, but the witnesses have very few of them. Um, very, very rarely does a bloodless medicine patient decline hyperbarics. 
And um, we did have a few patients who were really severely anemic that were really, really confused that just couldn't comply with the hyperbaric uh, treatment requirements. They have to be able to, we have to be able to talk to them during the treatment. They can't be pulling out their lines and stuff in the chamber. So there's been a couple of patients over the years that we had to withhold treatments on just because they were so altered. We have found that the patients who have acute blood loss anemia seem to have the best recovery of their reticulocyte count with hyperbarics. Here is just a quick summary of our statistics at Georgetown. We've been in service for about eight years. We've treated more than 2,000 inpatients, about 1,000 surgical patients. You can see that our mortality rates are quite low um, and the causes of death after surgical cases, there's only been five of them. Three had bleeding, one had in the mind, one had a seizure. So again, most of our patients do quite well with our, our bloodless medicine techniques. So what else do we do? All right, so we, again, we give erythropoietin stimulating agents, we give IV iron, we use hyperbarics, we limit unnecessary blood draws. These are all the things that are standard. I think the only new thing that I'm presenting here is hyperbarics. And then we recommend also good nutrition, vitamin supplementation, and we limit oxygen consum consuming activities. And if you are not aware, we made a website. So we have a system-wide, MedStar has a system-wide bloodless medicine website um, to help other clinicians throughout the world treat our bloodless medicine and Jehovah's Witness patients. We do have uh, specific um, sections on sp different techniques, including hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So I definitely encourage you to check out our website. And that is all I have. Thank you so much.